Welcome everybody to a vaccine update with the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, Information, Resources and Advocacy. Today, we wanna to welcome Sheridan Niccolo, Lisa Hooks and Sasha Bittner who will be presenting with us. Um, next slide. Next slide. For Zoom access, um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a closed caption button. If you click that, captions will appear on your screen, on the bottom of your screen. Our ASL interpreter today is not Tamara, it's Brandon. So thank you, Brandon. Um, to see the interpreter all the time, um, click on his video, the three dots at the top and select pin video. When the slides are showing, you can use the vertical bar, vertical bar on the right of the of the of the slide to make the window the videos smaller or larger. Next slide. Please keep your mics muted, your cameras off during the presentation so everyone can easily see the ASL interpreter. And during the question and answers at the end of the presentation, we'll unmute you if you're if we see you raise your hand or you type something in the chat. Thank you. Next. There will be a time for questions at the end. You can raise your hand, like I mentioned, and or if you can't do that and can't speak ver verbalize your questions, you can type them in the chat. Next. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Sheridan now to go ahead and take us into the presentation. Thanks, Sheridan. Great, thank you, Susan. And welcome everybody. We're glad to be here with you today. This is an update around COVID-19 vaccinations, the big picture with the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. And this presentation includes information provided by the California Community Vaccine Advisory Committee. So we're thankful for that data. The State Council on Developmental Disabilities is established by state and federal law as an independent state agency and ensures that Californians with developmental disabilities are guaranteed the same full and equal opportunities for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as all Americans. And we work on this in a few different ways. We work on this through advocacy, capacity building, and systemic change. And we are also responsible for the data collection and for community engagement with the National Core Indicators Project and the Movers Longitudinal Survey for California. Our work is you know, really in partnership with you all, Californians with disabilities, their families, and the professionals that serve them. And we do this so that we can all receive services and supports that we need to thrive and to actively communicate uh, be involved, engage in, and participate in our communities. So with that, uh, let's, let's move on to introductions. And I'd like to pass the mic over to my colleague, Lisa Hooks of the North Bay Regional Office. Thank you, Sheridan. Hi, thanks everyone for having me. My name is Lisa Hooks and I work over in the North Bay office, which is located in the city of Vallejo. We represent the Solano, Sonoma, and Napa County areas. Thank you again for having me and I hope this information is useful. Now, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague and peer, Sasha. Hi everyone, my name is Sasha Bittner. Hi everyone, my name is Sasha Bittner. I'm Lisa Bittner. I'm very I'm the chairperson for the Bay Area Regional Advisory Committee, San Mateo, which serves San Mateo, San Francisco, San Francisco, Marin, Marin, Alameda, Alameda, and Gardner County in Contra Costa counties. I'm also, I also got my second vaccine on May month 15. And I also got my second vaccine dose on March 15th. 
I'm very exciting. Very exciting. Great, thank you, Sasha. Next slide, please. So this slide here, it's not necessarily important for us to look in depth at this slide, but what you're viewing or uh, what's on the screen right now is a, uh, a graph that is showing the little blip, a little blue blip, which uh, represents the COVID cases um, starting from March 2020 through last week, uh, March of 2021. And it's showing that we have a, a small uh, blip of cases uh, around the summertime, around early summer, June and July. And then it sees a very substantial, big, big uh, mountain of, of sorts of cases, of COVID cases starting late fall of 2020 and then slowly ramping down in January and February of 2021. And this is a visual just to remind us all of what we've been through the last year. We've all had incredible losses uh, of varying kinds this last year. And the hope is looking at the end of this graph on the far right, and we'll see how far we've come. And the cases at this point are being reported uh, at much lower numbers. And what this reminds us of is this reminds us of a quote from the California Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. She recently said, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we are talking about how do we get there from here? And so I just wanted to highlight a little bit of data. Uh, some of the data I'm sharing with you is, is recent data as of late last week. So as of late last week in California, we've hit 58 million COVID tests in this state. We've had over 3.5 million COVID cases reported in California. And unfortunately, we have lost over 56,000 people. And the light that Dr. Nadine Burke Harris uh, may be referring to is vaccinations. Vaccinations are here in California. And as of uh, um, mid-March this month, uh, we were looking at uh, closing in on 14 million people um, that had received their, their vaccination doses so far. So it's even greater as of today and every day. We're going to keep making, uh, keep making ground and making progress on vaccination goals here in California. Next slide, please. And so a lot of the, the data that we're sharing with you today and that we are referencing quite often as we work hand in hand with our communities, uh, this data is from the, the Community Vaccine Advisory Committee, also known as CVAC. This is through the California Department of Public Health. Uh, the California Department of Public Health has both a scientific safety review work group, a drafting guidelines work group, and a Community Vaccine Advisory Committee. And the state council, along with other disability and aging advocates, are members specifically serving on that community vaccine advisory committee. And the focus uh, in a nutshell has been safety, transparency, and equity of vaccine, uh, of vaccine availability and distribution in California. And we keep listening and we keep learning. We also get a lot of data from you all in the community we hear your feedback, your stories, what's happening with, within different cities and different counties in California. Um, we learn a lot from you and then take that back in the form of advocacy at all different levels here in California. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk just a little bit about the vaccines and how they work. Uh, some of you watching today may be very knowledgeable and have been reading or listening to a lot of news on the vaccines, but we just wanted to provide some foundational knowledge for those folks that may be confused or aren't sure where we are currently with vaccines. And so we have three vaccines and this slide here talks about two, the first two that came here to California and that's the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Uh, both of those use a genetic code to stimulate the immune response against COVID-19 that was sequenced on a computer. So no cells were used in the creation of these two vaccines. There's no live or attenuated or inactive virus. 
It's not protein-based. It's not a DNA vaccine. Currently, the Pfizer vaccine is approved for uh, individuals ages 16 and up, and the Moderna is currently approved for folks 18 years uh, and up. And both of these, you, you may well know, need to be kept extremely co cold. The Pfizer vaccine must be kept at negative 70 degrees Celsius and the Moderna at negative 20 degrees Celsius. So that has been a challenge, obviously, for, um, for all kinds of professionals involved in vaccine distribution is making sure that these vaccines can be kept at these cold temperatures during tra uh, transit and storage before they end up in your arm. Next slide, please. And then this is a little bit newer of news. We saw a few weeks back the announcement of Johnson & Johnson's Janssen vaccine. Uh, like the other two vaccines that we talked about, the Janssen vaccine is, is rated highly effective, tests highly effective against preventing death and severe COVID. Um, and many of you know that this new vaccine, the Janssen vaccine from Johnson & Johnson is just one dose instead of two doses and is much easier to transport and store. So it's considered a pretty important tool uh, for the, the battle that we're all in right now to, to end this pandemic here in California. And it, the delivery is a little bit different, but the result is the same with the goal of protection from severe disease. Um, it, and it, re, while it relies on different technology, like the other two vaccine, it based on studies, it shows no signs of causing severe or lasting side effects uh, based on what we know now from, from the trials and from the studies. And it does have several advantages, including just needing one dose, which is uh, maybe preferable for some communities uh, in California that would benefit from having one dose versus two doses. And it delivers using a different type of, of product and it's considered a, a um, adenovirus. And what it is, is it's been modified. So it's a modified virus that can't make copies of itself and can't cause disease. Um, what I was reading is even if it could, apparently the disease in question would be very mild, like the form of a common cold, but it, that it's modified so that it can't replicate. And so for this vaccine, when it's injected, those particles uh, contain a, a code for a spike protein uh, contained in the form of DNA, not RNA, like the other two uh, vaccines. And that prompts the production of that spike, of that spike protein response in the body. So the body remembers, your cells remember how to respond in case it encounters the actual coronavirus. And it's important to mention that experts are saying, both in California and nationally, that really for most people, the best vaccine is going to be the one that you can get. So um, for, for many people, you, you won't necessarily have a choice when you book your appointment, you may or may not know ahead of time what vaccine they have at that particular site on that particular day. But most experts say that, you know, for most people, experts say for most people, the best vaccine is the one that you can get, especially right now, when it's still a little bit more challenging for eligible people to find vaccine appointments. Next slide. So a little bit more about the vaccine. So the Pfizer and Moderna, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you need two doses for full immunity at 21 to 28 days apart. That's the recommendation. The Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine, that's one dose for full immunity. And important to note that children um, uh, right now, you know, Pfizer's for, for children 16 and up, Moderna and the Johnson & Johnson for 18 and up. Uh, currently, uh, the FDA and, and companies are involved in trials for children under the age of 16. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, and again, the focus primarily for these three vaccines is, is are they effective at preventing hospitalization, serious illness and death from COVID-19? And all three of them are testing very strongly in that way. Important to know that, um, that rather that, that after your last dose, so for the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the CDC is saying really two weeks after that last dose is when you will have full immunity and the same thing for the, the one dose of the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine, that you wanna wait a couple of weeks 
And we'll talk a little later about uh, what the CDC is recommending for people that have had their vaccinations. Next slide, please. So availability. So this is as of mid-March, uh, as of a little more than a week ago. So doses delivered to California, about you know, just under 16 million, uh, receiving about 800,000 first doses per week. Doses administered, so shots in arms, that's around uh, 12 million with an average of 194,000 doses per day. And then 2 million, uh, 1, 182,300 of those as pharmacy doses. And we'll talk a little bit later on about the different places that you can go to look to book appointments. Um, we know that as of mid-March, we, we're at you know, close to, to 14 million people vaccinated. We've probably have, by the time you're seeing this, well exceeded 14 million vaccinated in California. Um, and we are seeing some shifts currently as people are getting their second doses and different sites where people are being vaccinated. Uh, maybe switching over to prioritize making sure people get those second doses. So they may be taking less first dose appointments and that's natural, you know, as new, as new doses, new supply comes into California at different times, it may be harder to get that first dose because the priority would be making sure that all those folks that got their first dose of the Pfizer Moderna, that they get their second dose. And obviously that's not a concern for the third uh, vaccine that we have available now in California. Next slide. So in short, if we were to say, okay, what are some of the five key areas of, you know, how do I best get my vaccine right now for those individuals who are eligible? And uh, our colleague, uh, Lisa Hooks, will talk just in a little bit more specifically about eligibility. But these are the five main areas in California. So first would be your healthcare provider. And particularly if you have high risk uh, health needs or health conditions, you have questions about if the vaccine is right for you or what the potential risks are of vaccination, definitely talk with your healthcare provider. And your healthcare provider may be the best place for you to first look at potentially booking an appointment to get your vaccination. We also wanna highlight the Federal Retail Pharmacy Program. And we have a hot link here on this slide. Uh, the Federal Retail Pharmacy Program is a great way, it combines uh, a bunch of different links for these federal retail pharmacies participating in the program and that are providing vaccinations across the state. We also, of course, many of you have been working closely with or been keeping up to date with what's happening with your local county health departments. And as a part of that, most county health departments are also working to develop pop-up clinics with local community-based organizations, with faith communities, and with other organizations in your community. So those two oftentimes are going together, both uh, vaccination clinics available through your county health department and in, in partnership with community-based organizations and with other agencies in your community, especially trusted messengers that can really target their outreach and make sure that people in uh, less served and underserved uh, communities can get their vaccination when eligible. And then the last resource for securing an appointment for those eligible would be my turn, myturn.ca.gov. You'll notice we also have the toll-free hotline listed up there. And uh, th that's a great way also to be able to look for open appointments to book and of note that the toll-free hotline that you see there on that slide has uh, language availability, lots of accessibility options, um, and about 250 or more languages available uh, to be able to help you over the phone look for appointments. And then last on this slide, we're mentioning a great newsletter uh, provided by Vaccinate All 58. And it's a great way to also stay informed and hear about new developments in addition, of course, to your local state council regional office, get on their emailing list as well. But uh, we wanted to make sure people knew that Vaccinate All 58 is a good newsletter and you can sign up using that email address that we have listed there. And remember, if you have questions or you're worried about how the COVID vaccine might impact you or a loved one, make sure to talk to someone who knows your health the best or who knows your loved one's health the best 
talk with your healthcare professionals uh, and get some advice so that you can make the right decision to, for you and your loved one. And with that, we'll move to the next slide and I will pass this on to our colleague, Lisa Hooks. Thank you, Sheridan. So let's talk about who can get vaccinated. So prior to March the 15th, which was just last week, there was a set of, of eligibility groups that could get vaccinated. And what the Department of Health was calling that was tiers. So at this point in time, the members, all of the, the folks who can get vaccinated in California as priority are those who are healthcare workers, long-term care and skilled nursing facility residents, Californians who are 65 years of age and older, food and agriculture workers, child care and education workers, emergency responders, and then they added those in high risk are congregate living spaces and certain public transit workers. One of the reasons that we are here today is because when this all started initially, they started prioritizing who should get the vaccine. But an important group of people, the one that we service and we support and we encourage to advocate on behalf of their own needs, is those individuals who just as of March 15th were barely given priority um, of approval for vaccination. And it's folks who are included in the group of severe health conditions and those with disabilities and serious illnesses. Next slide, please. When we speak of the newly eligible individuals that um, are included on this list as of March the 15th, we are speaking of those individuals who have cancer, those individuals who might experience chronic kidney disease stage four and above, individuals who might experience chronic pulmonary disease, individuals with Down syndrome, individuals with solid organ transplant, individuals who experience pregnancy, individuals with sickle cell, sickle cell disease, individuals with heart condition, individuals with severe obesity, individuals with type two diabetes. Next slide, please. And for the, most of us who are on this call and listening to us today, those individuals who, if as a result of a developmental or other severe high risk disability, have one or more of the following things apply. The individual is likely to develop severe life-threatening illness or death from a COVID-19 infection. The individual acquiring COVID-19 will limit, sorry, if acquiring COVID-19, the individual's ability to receive ongoing care and services vital to their well-being and survival will be limited or Providing adequate or timely COVID care will be particularly challenging as a result of the individual disability. Next slide, please. What this basically means is how do people with high risk conditions or disabilities get vaccinated? So one of the things that was challenging is individuals who have um, developmental or severe disabilities were saying that they were basically being asked to verify or vet the fact that they had a disability. And so people were saying, what does that mean? What do I do to prove that I have a disability and I am qualified to receive my vaccine right now as of March the 15th? You don't need to divulge any confidential health related information to anyone. That means you don't have to prove who you are and what you are and what your disability is in order to be vaccinated. You can simply tell the person at the vaccination site or while you're making an appointment that I am a person who as of March the 15th is eligible to receive the vaccine. And that is good enough. But let's be honest, we know that that's not how things always work in the real world. Someone is going to ask you prove that you are a person with a substantial disability or a developmental disability and is entitled to the vaccine. 
Don't panic. Don't get upset. Don't get frustrated. We're going to talk about some ways today in which you can go prepared. One of the ways, and Sasha will speak more on it later, is about knowing your rights. Okay. If you have any questions about what your rights are, you can contact your local disability rights education and defense fund office, or you can contact your local state council office, and we can talk more about that. But one of the things that you can do to try to get that appointment for your COVID vaccine is you can call the COVID hotline. And you see the number here up on the screen. It's available for you any day, Monday through Friday um, from eight to eight or Saturday through Sunday from eight to five. There is someone there to help you at this call number if you speak English or Spanish. But if you speak any other language or if you need some assistance with assistive technology or anything else, they will find you someone who can help you get the assistance that you need. It may just take a little bit longer, but they're designed to help you with over 250 languages. So somewhere out there, there is someone to help you. So do not panic, call the number and wait your turn, but let them know what you need. When you call, they will ask you, are you a person who is eligible to be vaccinated at this time? You will then say yes or no, okay? No other information is needed. They shouldn't get into, well, what is your disability? What makes you eligible? That is protected confidential medical information that you do not have to share unless you choose to share it. They may ask you for some additional information in order to help you if you need a reasonable accommodation, but the information is only being used for that purpose. For example, you may be a person who needs to find a wheelchair accessible site, okay? They will ask you that question. If you're a person with a disability who needs certain um, conditions on site in order to get your vaccine, like for instance, do you have a, um, a um, are you allergic? Do you have an allergic reaction if you get vaccines? Then you should probably be, be directed to a site that has medical professionals on site that can administer an EpiPen or some other type of assistance should you have a severe allergic reaction. Other than that, your confidential healthcare information is protected, okay? Next slide, please. More about eligibility verification. For individuals who are associated with or receive services from your local regional center, your local regional center right now is sending out letters to individuals that says this person is now eligible to receive the COVID vaccine. But that's only going to help some of those individuals who are associated with a regional center. What if you don't receive services for a regional center? How do you verify your eligibility? Again, you don't need to take your confidential medical records with you. What you can do is what we call self-certify or for the terminology that's used for COVID vaccines, it's called a self-attestation to the fact that you meet the criteria as a high risk medical condition or disability. All that simply is, is saying when the person asks you, are you a person with a high risk medical condition or disability who is eligible to receive the COVID vaccine? You say, yes, I am. That's it. You may be asked to sign a piece of paper that says you verify you are telling the truth that you are a person who is high risk medical condition or has a disability. That's all, that's it. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about eligibility versus availability. That's two different things. There are a lot of people who are eligible to receive the COVID vaccine as of March the 15th, 2021. But the honest answer is there's not the same amount availability of the COVID vaccine. And I'm sharing this with you because some people are talking about how hard it is to get an appointment 
to get your COVID vaccine. And we do understand that, but we don't want you to be discouraged because in reality, there's not enough vaccines for everyone who wants it right now at this time. So it's asking you to be patient, but do not give up. If it is your desire to be vaccinated, speak with someone locally, either at your defense, um, your local disability rights education and defense fund agency or your state council office and figure out where you can go, what you can do in order to get vaccinated. As Sheridan spoke about earlier, there are about five different ways or different places that you can go to or organizations that you can go to to get assistance with getting vaccinated. But you also can go onto the My Turn website in order to get more information. But even if you sign up for the My Turn website to say that I want to get vaccinated, remember, there's not enough vaccinations to go around. But another thing you can do is go to the Vaccine Finder website and find out if there are any places that are locally that may have vaccines available because there's not enough people who actually want it in that area for that day and that time. Sometimes that happens and that means you can call them or you can drive there or catch public transportation there and you might be one of the lucky ones on that day who can get vaccinated without an appointment just because you popped up. But I'm not gonna say that always works. So again, this thing is very frustrating and it's limited supply and demand. We all know what that's about. But let me tell you, the supply should not be based on the fact that you have to pay for it. If you are hearing about any instances where people are paying for vaccines or people are giving priority vaccines who don't meet eligibility con um, criteria, please contact one of our local offices and let us know. We'd like to hear about stories about that. So just to let you know when we talk about numbers so that you can understand how many vaccines are available right now, there is about 40 million people in the state of California. Approximately 40 to 45% of those people are now eligible to receive the vaccine. That means about 16 to 18 million people, those are some large numbers, 16 to 18 million people can now qualify to get the COVID vaccine. Now, if you get the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, you will need two injections. So when we talk about those numbers, if you get one, you'll need two. So when we talk about how many we need in a vaccine, we need enough for two shots for those people getting the Pfizer and the Moderna and enough for people to get one shot if they're getting the Johnson & Johnson. If you look at the numbers here on the screen, if we take those 16 to 18 million people who actually are eligible and think about 4 million of those are like all of us who are on this call today, either high risk or people with disabilities. We only have in stock about 15 million doses on hand. Look at the last line on this slide and it says supply is less than half to meet everyone who's eligible. That means some of us will have to wait a little longer than others, but eventually everybody will get their turn. Next slide, please. So again, we're talking about setting priorities for those who really need the vaccine. That's what we're here about today. People who are at high risk and with disabilities who really need the vaccine because without it, the chances of catching COVID or being exposed to COVID is greater than those who are, may not experience certain disabilities or high-risk medical conditions. So currently, there is not enough supply to immunize all persons who are willing to accept the vaccine. California is crafting a fair, equitable, and evidence-based and transparent policy to prioritize those who should be offered the vaccine initially until the capacity to manufacture and administer the vaccine increases. In other words, we need to hear from you. We need to hear from people who are high risk, who are sensitive in nature to being sick for various reasons, who are more likely to come into contact with those who may be exposed to COVID, people with disabilities. We need to hear from you to tell us what can we do 
to make sure that you have equal and fair access to the vaccine. This is why we are here today. If you have information you wanna share with us on how we can share it further up with the state and all those who will listen about how to create a fair, equitable, transparent delivery of vaccine to those who most need it right now while we have it available until we can make it available to everyone. Contact your local state council office or your local disability rights and defense and disability rights education and defense fund agency. Next slide, please. Access matters. As we all know, you want the vaccine, we want you to have the vaccine, but you have to, it has to be accessible. And that's not always the easiest to get out there, that it should be accessible to every community, to everyone who is in need. You do not have to have insurance in order to get vaccinated. So if you're concerned that you don't have insurance, so you don't qualify for getting vaccinated, even though you have a high risk medical condition or is a person with a disability, don't worry, insurance is not a requirement. Neither is the cost. There is no cost for the vaccine. You don't have to pay anything. Also, if you're a person who meets the high risk category or a person with disabilities or any of those other things that qualify you right now, your citizenship or document, documented citizenship status is not one of the criteria that you must meet in order to get vaccinated. That should not come up. If it does come up and you have some concerns, please contact us so we can find out what's happening. Being vaccinated against COVID is for the community. It's for us as the people while we're here. This thing is hitting us worldwide. We're speaking about everyone. If you'd like to be vaccinated, there should be an opportunity when it's your time to be vaccinated. If you have any questions about that, please reach out to us. Next slide, please. What we can do to continue this thing on. So we're speaking particularly about everyone who's eligible that they, you would have access to it, but also particularly people with disabilities are finding themselves not having the access that they need, not understanding what their rights and entitlements are in order to be vaccinated. And we wanna just share with you that you can do something about this. You can make sure that even once you receive your vaccine, and even once you are saying, you're hearing from others that they can't, that the biggest thing you can do is advocate for yourself and for others, that there is equal access to all. And to talk more to, to you about this, I'm going to turn this over to Sasha. She's going to let you know what you can do to continue this thing on once we end the call today. Sasha? Um, thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so much, Lisa. And the first I'm going to talk about my experience. First, I'm going to talk about my experience. I got the Pfizer vaccine at the Oakland Coliseum. I got the Pfizer vaccine at the Oakland Coliseum. And my second dose was Monday, March 15th. And my second dose was Monday, March 15th. And so in a week, I will be fully immunized. So in a week, I'll be fully immunized. My symptoms after my second dose came about nine hours after. My symptoms after my second dose of the vaccine came on about nine hours after. And persisted heavily for about 24 hours. And persisted heavily for 24 hours. My symptoms included cells. My symptoms included chills, fever, fever, headache, headache, tiredness, tiredness, and very achy bones. And very achy bones. But the first dose I just had a sore arm and was a bit dizzy. For the first dose, I just had a sore arm and was a bit dizzy. I found out the first time about the vaccine opportunity that me. I found out about the first vaccine opportunity suddenly. And so, 
So I had had only coffee that day. I hadn't had water. The, the second time I hydrated before and after. The second time I hydrated before and after. And I know dizziness. And I had no dizziness. And so please drink water. So please drink water. And so I wanted to talk about how we got here. Um, so I wanted to talk about how we got here. It was a very great words that put together where we are now. It was a very grassroots effort to get to where we are now. And by the next we took both grassroots organization and activist on the ground. It actually took both grassroots organizations and activists on the ground. And well as those within the government. As well as those within government. To get Governor Newsom. To get Governor Newsom. Um, to make us a priority. To make us a priority. And then we did it up to disclose our disability when we got the vaccine. And so we didn't have to disclose our disability when we get the vaccine. With, with a very big deal. Which is a very big deal. And all the local efforts. It also took local efforts. To make sure that counties. To make sure that counties. And it turned out with how important it was. So the counties understood how important it was. And that they would be born out of to getting the vaccine. How important it was that disabled people not have barriers to getting the vaccine. And now, grassroots organizations. Now, grassroots organizations. Um, um, I'm focusing, I'm focusing. I know the most the need of the vaccine. Are focusing on getting those uh, most in need of the vaccine. Mm, their Their shot. I'm, for example, senior and disability action in San Francisco. For example, senior and disability action in San Francisco. And having volunteers calling people. It's having volunteers calling people. And having other volunteers such as myself. And having other volunteers such as myself. Looking up appointments on my turn. Looking up appointments on my turn. There is still a limited supply though. There is still a limited supply though. So it would take time to do that. So it will take time to do that. Um, and um, and um, I also wanted to touch briefly on another issue. I also wanted to touch briefly on another issue. I unfortunately we have seen people question, um, I question on social media. I've unfortunately have seen people question on social media. I'm out why some got the vaccine before they did. About why someone got the vaccine before they did. And this happens to you, there is no need to respond. And if this happens to you, there's no reason to respond. And they do this to all of us need the vaccine. The truth is that all of us need the vaccine. The tensions are running high. So tensions are running high. And there have been major issues with distribution. And there have been major issues with distribution. But that is the default of an individual patient. But that isn't the fault of an individual patient. And you don't have to disclose. 
And the video on the one can And you don't have to disclose your disability or underlying condition. Um, um, and I, and, um, I'll remember that if you don't go to your own medical provider. And also know that if you don't go to your own medical provider. You do not have to show documentation. You do not have to show documentation. I know that they know the board of services. And the reason is that it's a sent out letters. I know that in-home supportive services and regional centers have sent out letters. I got mine from my last Friday. I got mine from IHSS last Friday. But you do not need them. But you do not need them. And the, you know, the, and if you have a few seconds, go you state council. And if you have issues, again, call your local state council. Oh, um, call Dredif. Or call Dredif. Um, you know, but, you know, it's really important that you feel empowered to do, to do what is right for you. But it's very important for you to do what's right for you. And I also just to know that if you decide not to get a vaccine, and just to know that if you decide not to get the vaccine, you don't or don't have to. Like you don't have to. Um. um you don't have to say why. You also don't have to say why. Yes, you decision. It's your decision. And I'm dead. That's it for me. And that's it for me. Thank you, Sasha. Next slide, please. So you heard from our chair of the Regional Advisory Committee for the Bay Area Office on grassroots advocacy, knowing your rights, both acknowledging and fighting stigma and the power of lived experience. Um, so at this point, we'd like to go ahead and close the deck so you can see us all better. And we wanted to cover a couple of questions that have come up uh, either through email or through the registration process for this event. Some people sent in some questions that they wanted to know the answer to. And we also wanted to remind people of a couple of resources that are available. We have a variety of COVID related resources for people, for people with disabilities, for family advocates and other advocates and professionals serving people with disabilities including uh, handouts and resources on how to avoid COVID scams uh, and other things that you can know about your rights and about vaccination and how to stay safe uh, during this pandemic. We also wanna draw attention to that the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has some really great handouts in a more simple language that talk about what you can and can't do, what you should and shouldn't do after you've been fully vaccinated, and the key things for you to know about COVID-19 vaccines. So that's available on their website. And then we also wanted to draw attention that late last week, the California Department of Developmental Services posted a frequently asked questions, and that's available on their website. And those frequently asked questions are specific to the COVID-19 vaccine for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So those are just a few things we wanted to make sure you knew about. Now, let me see at some of the questions here that were sent in. Hmm. Okay. Okay, how about this? We had somebody write in that said that they have a son who is autistic and who also has a severe peanut milk and milk allergy. <coughs> And this person wonders which va vaccine is the safest or how they should go about considering if, the, if any vaccine is safe. And they also noted that this um, son, this young man is also uh, afraid of injections. And so is, is wondering if the Johnson & Johnson one shot is a better situation for his needs. 
Would would someone like to to take a stab at that? And um, I don't know if people are like we you know with when it's best in terms of allergies. I know that when I got it, they had to buy had any allergies. And if I had, I would have. Sasha is saying that when uh, when you went to get the vaccine, Sasha, you said they asked if you, you've had any allergies. And if I had had allergies, I would have waited. And if I had had allergies, I would have waited. 30 minutes after I got my shot. 30 minutes after you got your shot. And to make sure so I did it up with a few reactions. To make sure that you didn't have a severe reaction. Um, but it may be better to do one thought that for me thought than one. Than and it may be better in that case to for one shot instead of two. Yeah, but um, I have a few friends with a few allergies and there hasn't been a problem. I, I have a few friends with allergies and that hasn't been a problem. Yeah, I agree, Sasha. And, you know, in general, for anybody who, that is concerned about how they may, re may react to any of the vaccines, the best thing to do would be to talk with your GP or with your medical specialist about you or your loved one's personal and medical risk factors. And, um, and then it may be helpful when you're seeking to get the vaccine, should you choose to get the vaccine, to get it from a location that can meet your access and functional needs and that goes back to you know, what Lisa had shared with us earlier that uh, different sites have different abilities to meet people's access and functional needs. Um, for example, there's a lot of uh, ways that people can meet access and functional needs at some of the federal state partnership sites here in California. And then there are also some pop-up clinics that are specifically targeting certain populations and can offer a lot of accommodations. Uh, for access and functional needs. So you probably wanna find out about that when you book your, uh, your vaccination appointment to make sure that wherever you go, that they can meet your specific needs or your loved one's needs. And I'd just like to add to that. Thank you, Sasha and Sheridan for that answer. Um, also remember out of the three vaccines, only the Pfizer is available for those under the age of 18, between 16 and 18. So if this young man that we're speaking about um, is a person between 16 and 18, you also need to bring that up with the general practitioner or your primary care. Um, so that may be, you need to get approval to get the one shot Johnson, which is only approved for 18 and other. So having all of that information prepared beforehand can help you. Hmm. And somebody else wrote in and said, how long does it take to get results back from a COVID-19 test or results from a vaccination, a COVID-19 vaccination? And uh, just a couple of notes that we had on this. Uh, let's first talk about COVID-19 tests. So some tests are called point of care tests, meaning that the results can be made available at the testing site in less than an hour. Um, like the rapid COVID antigen tests that Governor Newsom and State Superintendent Tony Thurman announced um, a week or two ago that they would deploy to high need schools. Uh, so those, those results can be actually be provided in as little as 15 minutes, which is pretty awesome. Uh, other tests are gonna take longer. Uh, any tests that have to be sent to a laboratory to analyze, that can take one to two days once it's received by the laboratory. Um, and testing the same person more than once in a 24 hour period is not recommended at this point. And then with regards to the COVID-19 vaccination, the CDC is recommending that people um, you know, know that they probably don't have the full benefit of their vaccines up until two weeks after their last dose, their last vaccination dose. Yeah, I have it on my camera. March 29th, oh, I have a seen on my calendar that says fully vaccinated, yay! March 29th, <laughs> fully vaccinated. All right, Sasha, nice, nice. Uh, let's see here. 
Okay, here's a question, guys. So we'll, we'll do one more question here. Healthcare workers are in a priority group for the vaccine, but what about family members who provide personal assistance and care services for free? Uh, so these are people that may not have documentation or proof that they are healthcare workers. How do those folks get vaccinated? Anyone want to take a shot at that? Well, go ahead, Sasha, and explain that to him, please. Yeah, I'm um, like been different answers. I feel like there's been different answers. And then for the school, I know you can do a self them. And then for the school, you can have your client on in your family. In San Francisco, you can have your client on your family member. Or your family member. Yeah, I'm sign, I'm sign something. Sign something. But I know it's been difficult for other counties. But I know it's been difficult for some other counties. Yeah, Sasha, Sasha I agree with that. Um, certainly, IHSS and public authorities and regional centers have provided letters for family health care workers. Um, and so if you or your family member or your uh, client that you serve has services from IHSS or from regional centers, definitely reach out to them and um, so that you know they can get a, a letter uh, verifying your work for them so that you can have that. Um, others that don't have those services are often uh, choosing to ask for letters either from their family member or their, their client's doctors or medical team indicating you know, Sheridan has a, an unpaid caretaker or a family caretaker. Uh, this is their name and this is what they do for Sheridan um, as an example. Um, and that includes for services like, um, like, like CCS. I know people have been talking about the importance of um, services, including those like California Children's Services to provide letters uh, in case family caregivers need them. So. Um, Sometimes it's been case by case and takes a little bit of work, particularly for unpaid uh, caregivers. And uh, certainly your local state council office is happy to brainstorm a little bit with you and give you some support and ideas of what you can do to make sure that you get uh, what you need to be vaccinated if you are a family um, personal assistance provider or a family healthcare worker. Yeah. And then in general, it, okay, we'll flip in one more here. So somebody writes, are there mobile clinics available? How do I find mobile clinics in my area? Anybody want to grab that one? I know we're finding that bathroom then for the good moment. Say that one more time, Sasha. I'm sorry. I know we're fighting that battle. I know well, we're fighting that battle. And that will be a battle if they 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 want to make wait until the mom something and something the vaccine. Yeah, they they're wanting uh to wait until there's more Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And like the, 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 the opinion. And there's some differences of opinion with the community, yeah. right? In terms of the speed of opening up mobile clinics. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Different counties right now uh, seem to be uh, in different places in terms of the development and the rollout of mobile clinics. As we mentioned earlier, most county public health departments are also working with trusted messenger, community-based organization, um, faith-based communities to open up pop-up clinics or are working um, with their staff and other nursing staff to offer mobile clinics. Um, and, and it takes a while. So counties are at different stages for that. And um, some counties are doing a great job and they have a bunch of pop-up clinics, uh, but they're a little bit slower in terms of being able to organize home-to-home -home or door-to-door -door vaccination for those individuals um, that are truly homebound because of medical needs or behavioral needs that they're dealing with. So um, 
I would say here's where um, advocate, make your voice heard. And also it helps to have a little bit of patience too because a lot of these plans are underway uh, and are at various stages of rollout in different counties across the state. Great, Susan, I think we can pass it back to you. Well, thank you all so much for all of this information today. Thank you to Brandon for interpreting and our captioner for captioning. And we'll see you all out there and hopefully we'll see you after everyone's vaccinated and we're out in the world again. Take care, everybody. Thank you for everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.